action. So welcome to series three, episode two of Entangled Discussions, Business in Quantum or Quantum in Business. Um, in today's talk, we'll address the interaction between quantum computing and business, and also how people from a business background are making really important contributions to the development of the quantum industry. So our guest today, Danica Hannon of Cambridge Quantum Computing, is a serial innovator and relationship builder who, through a long-held interest in quantum, a pedigree in business, and exceptional interpersonal skill, is able to offer the perfect insight into how technology can play an important role in creating new business cases for established industries, as well as sectors that are less established, and even those that do not yet exist. Um, there is also some huge breaking news to discuss today, so make sure you stay to the end. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you today, Danica. Thank you so much, Sean. It's such a privilege to be here. And for everyone on the call, I really appreciate you taking the time out of this. It means so much to see the community come together, and it's uh, really a treat to be able to talk with you all. And um, so, with with such a, a fascinating career path, um, it'd be great to start by exploring your personal journey and what's led you to this point, and, and if you've got any advice for those wanting to follow in your footsteps. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start with how I got here, and it's a little bit of a long story. <laughs> um, so I won't go into detail to the point where I bore you, but my original undergraduate degree is in global food and agriculture. So I was looking at in countries that have more limited resources, um, how do you pull things together to make sure that their farming is successful? So is it an issue of they don't have enough water or is it an issue of there's not the infrastructure to be able to get their crops to a marketplace? So it's really looking at how does everything fit together? And when you change one part of a system, how does that affect the whole? Um, so when I graduated, I got to go into the food industry and I spent a couple of years there and it was a, a really interesting experience, but I realized that ultimately the industry wasn't quite the best it. So what I did was I took all the work that I had built up with teamwork and problem solving, and I used that to pivot into fintech. And around the same time that I did that, something pretty neat happened. So my schedule opened up quite a bit, and I decided that I wanted to start reading. And I thought of a book that I'd first heard of years ago, all the way back when I was in high school. I had a physics teacher who told our class about how he was reading a book on quantum mechanics and how he could only read a little bit of the book before he'd have to stop and put it down. And at the time, I didn't get it. I, I just didn't understand in my head. It's like, you're, you're a teacher who teaches physics. Why can't you understand this stuff? And the name of that book stuck with me. So when I switched into FinTech and got more time, I started reading that book and the exact same thing happened to me. <laughs> I could only read a little bit of that book before it was just too much and I had to put it down and then I could start reading a little bit more and then I had to put it down. And I was hooked on quantum mechanics and it got to a point where I, I read through that book that I ended up picking up another. I started reading journal articles about it. And for a couple of years, it was, I was spending my nights and weekends really learning about quantum mechanics in the space. And after a while, it got to a point where I was like, man, you're spending so much time on this why don't you see if you can do something with this professionally so that you can spend even more time on it? And I love business, as John mentioned, and that's really where my roots are. So it's like, what combines quantum mechanics and business? And I, quantum computing popped into mind, so I Googled it. So somewhere along the way, I'm sure that I heard a news story about quantum computing or I, I saw something about it on the internet, but I didn't really know what it was. It just, it was something that came to mind. So I Googled it and knew I found a good fit. And then from there, that was in 2018, that's when things really started to take off. And I found a mentor in that space who was really pivotal for giving me guidance. I co-founded the Minnesota Quantum Computing Meetup. Uh, through there, I met another mentor who recommended learning about AI because he thought it would be a really useful thing to know for the quantum computing space. So I went through a data science boot camp. Um, from there, I became an advisor on Women in Quantum Boards. So I'm no longer an advisor there. I, still think they're doing fantastic work. And through them, I got introduced to a quantum computing startup that was focused on quantum computing and ag. And they're called Bolts AI and they're doing incredible things. Um, so T, I'm gonna give you a shout out. T is on that team. So if you have any questions about them, T is really wonderful to work with. And I know she can help you out there. And through Bolts, I met one of my former bosses here at Cambridge Quantum. And he reached out to me in November of last year and said the role was opening up that he thought I might be a good fit for and asked if I'd be interested in it. 
Um, so John, getting here, it seemed like it was a series of very happy occurrences. And you know, before this talk, you and I were chatting, we were talking about how there's a phrase of the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. <laughs> and that really held true here of it seems like the more work I put into this and the more strategic I got over the years, uh, the more things sped up and the more I was able to find a path here. Yeah, and, and, and actually it's, it's, it's really nice to, to sort of um, share that journey and, and certain things that um, I, I can certainly relate to the <clears throat> when, when you first start reading the, the material and you kind of have to read it several times or, or come back to it. And um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's really interesting um, dichotomy there. And it, it, it's great to see the, the, that, that diligent hard work really paying off and, uh, and, and, and how, how it's paid off so spectacularly. Um, and obviously you're, you're now um, at, at Cambridge Quantum Computing and, and working as a, a really crucial interface between the, the outstanding technology that CQC uh, create and the businesses that will benefit from that technology. Um, how, how do you, how do the, the research needs and the, and the business needs interact with each other? Yeah, so we are driven by the research side and we have a fantastic team of scientists that works incredibly hard to constantly be um, looking at how we can improve on existing algorithms or how we can create new ones entirely. So we're very science driven and we're looking at with the current capabilities of quantum computing hardware, what can we do? So what can we do if we what can we do with what we have right now? Because there's a lot of excitement about what we can do in the future, but to make sure that we're adding value at the present, and we need to work with the constraints that we have. So we're very science driven in that our scientific teams are constantly innovating and are doing a lot of really exciting stuff. And there's a lot of cool publications out on our website. Um, but then where it, the poll side comes from the businesses, we'll take these new announcements and we'll go reach out to potential clients or talk to existing ones and say, hey, here's what our scientists have been working on. How do you see this getting applied? And that's where it can really get fun. You, listening to people talk about the different business use cases that they see for them. Like there's a, a call I had the really good fortune of being on a few weeks ago where there's this team at a company where they've been wanting to build out quantum computing for a couple of years. So it's something that they've been paying very close attention to. And when I was talking to them, they brought up a few different use cases that I never even thought of. And it made complete sense. And my sense is that it would work very well with optimization, with the algorithms that we have and with the hardware that we have right now. But it was, it was breathtaking to just listen to them and think, wow, you know, this is so creative. And this is something that I've never thought of before. And this really seems like it could work. So to your point about that push pull, John, we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of push from the scientific teams who are just doing this incredibly innovative work. And then the pull comes from when you start talking to the business and the business people, start bringing up use cases that I never thought of. And that's that's a really neat moment. Yeah, and I think I think that that's something that um, the, the the quantum industry or the quantum computing industry has taken particular care of is is making sure uh, first of all making sure that the that the message and the hype is is managed in the in the right way uh, but also interacting with the um, the business or scientific landscape in terms of making sure that, that the fit is right and and that i suppose it's a case of you know what what does what does the what requirements do you have from uh, quantum computing rather than this is what it can do fit in with it it's, it's nice that um, that interaction um, how that's how that's panning out so um, it, it, and it, it's, it's really it's really interesting that some of those some of those use cases or business cases that come up that even a couple of years ago no one could have imagined and, and what what the future may hold as well so and you know, the, the, quantum, the, the quantum industry is moving at incredible pace and we are just scratching the surface of such a profound revolution. Um, from, from your vantage point, where, where do you see the, the sort of most interesting potential for quantum computing to create um, really innovative um, business use cases? Yeah, so one of the neat things that we've been working on at CQC that we just released is a paper on a Monte Carlo algorithm integration. So with that, we're seeing a really nice speed up over classical computers compared to quantum computers of Monte Carlo. And that can be applied to logistics, supply chain, with financial portfolios, it can give you a nice speed up. 
Um, so Monte Carlo is a really fun one that we're looking at right now because it can be applied to so many different industries. And that's one of those immediate use cases where we can start adding value for people right away. And we know that there's a lot of demand and need for that in the market. So in the near term, I am very excited about Monte Carlo. And I've got a, a prop to show you. <laughs> so this is a, a book that was written by one of our scientists here at Cambridge Quantum Computing is Professor Bob Kowacki. And he is leading our quantum natural language processing team. So Bob has written this book about picturing quantum processes and it's really forms the foundation of quantum natural language processing. And I'm so excited to see where that goes because that has incredible potential. If you think about all the text data that we produce in a single day, everything that goes out onto Twitter, all the emails that we send, all the internal reports that get written up and NLP is this huge space. So personally, I'd love to see if therapy is something that we could look at with telehealth, because we know there's a really big demand for good mental health services that are also affordable and accessible. So telehealth is something where this could be applied to. And natural language generation is something else that could be a really interesting use case. So for the near term, I'm very excited about Monte Carlo and seeing which industries we can apply that to. And for the long term, I'm so excited to keep watching QNLP grow. Yeah, and I think with the the, the the sort of the the healthcare medical side of things, it was it was an area that was. Um, I think logical for what quantum computers can do anyway. Um, and obviously since the, the pandemic, it's become much more into focus outside of just the quantum community, um, you know, whether it's gene sequencing or chemical analysis, um, there, there, there's so many potential applications that, um, that, that were potentially a good fit, but have become really, really fashionable or fashionable is probably the wrong word, but have become really prominent in, in the discussion. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of the, I suppose it's the, one of the silver linings to what's been, um, a, an undesirable situation is that, um, you know, necessity is, is the, um, create mother of invention, as they say. Um, so, so hopefully, you know, hopefully, um, the, the, the work that, that, that you're doing and, and Cambridge quantum computing are doing can, can kind of be that, that shining knight coming over, you know, the cavalry coming over the, the hill so for, for for you know for next for this time and for next time um and is there so is there um any any particular areas um within that that uh, that that are um of a particular focus so for example an area that um i i find fascinating is the the quantum machine learning because both from an aspect that it's um, it, it's a powerful, you know, extremely powerful tool for creating the the fundamental hardware and uh, and the algorithms, but then also how it how it will interact with applications that or, or integration with businesses. It it kind of covers um, the whole, or, or it covers a lot of areas within quantum computing. So, are there any areas um, such as that, that that are particularly interesting to you? Um, yeah, so real quick, I'm seeing a few questions coming into the chat. So see, we see those coming in. I would love to answer them in just a moment. Please do, please do. Uh, yeah, so for, the, for your question first for QML, uh, there's another paper that we put out recently about how we've taught, there's an algorithm that can reason and it can reason similar to how a human can. And I've been seeing some really interesting articles lately about how one of the most complex things that we still don't understand is the human brain. <laughs> so we don't understand entirely how we think. And what we're starting to see as breakthrough with, with this quantum machine learning model that can reason is that it's giving us some more insights into how humans think and how humans reason. And John, to your point about this incredible need and demand that's starting to rise up, there are our world's only getting more complex. So we're going to have more need for things that can reason quickly and accurately and thoughtfully. So while I am not entirely sure where this will go, I can think of so many different areas where, whether it's maybe a traveling salesman and you need to be able to make complex decisions really quickly, or it's something that can 
this would probably be very far reaching, but something that could look at a situation and triage it really quickly and figure out what's the best path forward. So maybe that would help with uh, medical diagnosis and reasoning in a hospital setting. So that's something where there is an incredible amount of opportunity as you think about the power of a machine being able to reason more similarly to a human. Um, the drawback is that I'm not entirely sure where we'll see it go, but I think that's an area where the business is going to lead. And as we go out into the market and talk to people, we'll start to figure out where are they seeing need for this and how can we plug in. Now I'll look to the chat. So Amrita, you had the <clears throat> first question. So asking about how quantum natural language processing can help in finance and business. That's a fantastic question. And what I'll do for you is I'll follow up with Bob Kowacki because he's the ultimate expert. And because QNLP is something that I'm beginning to learn about, I think the best person to ask would be to go straight to the expert on this one. So I'll follow up with Bob for you on that. Okay, so then uh, Manan asked, apart from the software and the algorithms, uh, what's the status of hardware development at CQC? So Manan, that's another very good question and all these questions are great. Um, with CQC, what we do is we're hardware agnostic. So to your point, we really focus on developing a ticket our software platform. And then we have five frameworks that stand on top of that. So you have quantum natural language processing, quantum machine learning, optimization, human or quantum chemistry, and quantum cybersecurity. So the beauty of being able to focus on the software side is that we can really make sure that we're building out the best software that we can and building out very strong applications in those five spaces. And then we get to partner with all kinds of hardware providers. So we work with IBM, uh, Honeywell, we have an extremely close re relationship with uh, Google. And we also work with a lot of the startups like Rigetti, IonQ, and AQT. So the benefit of that is that while we don't focus on developing the hardware ourselves, our software is, ticket is hardware agnostic. So we can run it on all these different types of quantum computers. And what we found over time is that some algorithms will run better on one type of quantum computer versus another. So this really frees us up to make sure that we're running on the we're running the algorithms on the quantum computer that we feel is going to give them the best performance. And that way our clients can get the greatest quantum advantage that they possibly can. Um, so we are we're pretty focused on the software side. Now that did just change today. <laughs> we'll talk yeah. about that more later on. There was a pretty exciting announcement. And um, so in the future that may change, uh, but right now we are hardware agnostic and we're very fortunate to be able to uh, make sure that we're adding as much value as we can on the software side. And we get to partner with a lot of really great hardware providers. Um, Brian, I see you have a question about what specialized roles are you seeing evolving to liaise between business and quantum internally and externally? Um, yeah, so Brian, that's a great question. And for my role as a relationship manager, what I get to do is for existing clients, make sure that we're adding as much value as we can, and then doing a lot of outreach to cold clients or cold prospects to see if we can add value for them. So from my point of view, um, what I'm starting to see as there's a growing business need for this is people who can think strategically, who can be very emotionally intelligent and who can have that creative problem solving. So you can look around and say, you know what? I see that big company over there and I have a hunch that we could plug in that we could really help them solve some problems, but let's try and go make contact with them and see what we can do. And one of my team members, Anand, is on the line as well. And Anand is a business development manager here at CQC. And Anand has a fantastic role where he looks at the algorithms that we've put out and when these papers come out, they tend to be pretty heavily technical. So Anand is the coolest thing where he'll go through and he'll pull out the business value of all these papers and he'll um, translate the business value of them and then he'll bring those to market. So Brian, we're, we're starting to see more emotional intelligence and creativity and strategic problem solving uh, become in demand. But am I making any sense? <laughs> And, and I think just to just to kind of echo those comments from a from a recruitment perspective. So, when I first started working within the quantum arena uh, back in 2014, it was very much a place for um, for you know for scientists for people creating fundamental um, uh, fundamental science. So that's now evolved where there's kind of two strands that that are or two themes that are that are becoming very important, and that's the the scientist business hybrid whether that's product management, application management, or engineering, scientific sales. So people with the, the, you know, the traditional sort of PhD scientists who, who are learning business, 
and then there's also um, roles that, that people like Danica are performing so well in where they're bringing the, the, the business um, aspects to it and, and applying those to the quantum landscape. And, and, and on all of those different layers are, are absolutely fundamental because it's such a big project that's, that's being undertaken that we, we, we need everyone pulling in the same direction. So um, that, that's a trend that I, I've noticed um, and, and it's been accelerating, particularly over the last sort of two, three, four years. Um, it, it's it's been accelerating um, into those the, the business and the technology becoming closer and closer together. Yeah, I completely agree with you, John. Um, Peter, I saw you asked a question about the link to the QML reasoning paper. So I sent a link in about our press announcement for it, and then it's got a link to I believe it's archive where you can read that paper. Um, okay. Let's see. So insights on quantum security and crypto. Ooh, Raj Prasad, that's a, a very interesting question. So <laughs> I actually, so with crypto, in all honesty, that's something where I need to really be doing more research because I've started to see things popping up about uh, quantum computing and blockchain. And that's something that I, I don't know enough about, but I would really like to dig in there more. So if you have any thoughts on that, I would love to hear it. On the cybersecurity side, uh, what we're doing is we have a product called Iron Bridge. So it's really working on making sure that our encryptions are secure from quantum computers. And we have figured out that with a quantum computer that has as little as four bits, we can generate keys that have perfect entropy and perfect randomness to them. So we can help our clients start to figure out, okay, so knowing that this this looming threat is on the horizon that quantum computers are going to break encryption. How do we start slowly but surely preparing for that right now? So on the cybersecurity side, we're doing a lot of work with different clients who have sensitive information and who want to get ahead of that threat so that by the time it's here, they've already got their defenses up and they're not trying to play catch up to that. And then I think that that kind of defensive and offensive mindset is, is, is really important. Um, because th th there's there's data that may be encrypted, but may still be sensitive by the time that uh, quantum computers are powerful enough to crack it. Um, and then there's also the, the the technology that will crack it. So there's kind of two sides to that coin, um, and, and both are both are equally fundamental to making sure that that security is implemented in the right way. Um, and yeah, I think I think there's some some non-technical challenges that, that that may come up on that front as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I saw a question, or Amrita made a comment about our work with IBM and how we've integrated with them for quantum cybersecurity. And I'm trying to find it in the press releases, so I'll keep going through those on the side. But Amrita, you're absolutely right. We've done work with IBM that we're very proud of, and I believe that press release is back in 2020. I saw a comment from Manisha. So Manisha, you asked about um, what is quantum computing? And I know we have a lot of people with very deep expertise in the audience. If you'd like to turn on your microphone and chime in here, please feel free to do so. So the way that I look at quantum computing from a business standpoint is that it can help us solve these incredibly uh, challenging problems that we haven't had the capacity to solve before because classical computers haven't had the ability to take on as many variables or as much data as we need to. So some really neat examples of what we're doing with quantum computing is uh, drug discovery is a really big space where we're speeding up drug discovery there. Um, optimization is another huge one. If you're familiar with the traveling salesman problem, the number of routes you can take scales very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> So from a business standpoint, quantum computing is helping us to open up problems that we couldn't tackle in the past, but we've always had an inkling of these are areas that are really high value. So my sense is that that's part of why it's taking off, even though we're just scratching the surface, is because we can see that there is so much raw potential here. And we're getting to a point where we're starting to, to pull that raw potential out and actually make things happen and really drive beneficial things and add a lot of value with it. Uh, but like I mentioned, I know there's a ton of expertise here in the audience. If anyone else would like to add to that, please feel free to do so. Yeah, and, and to echo that, it's, it's entangled discussion, so we are open for people to to take the mic as well. <laughs> um, and, and I, I think I, I was at um, Inside, Inside uh, Quantum Technology a couple of weeks ago, um, and um, one of the I think one of the, the the stats someone pulled up about the traveling salesman issue is that some of the big delivery firms 
um, could save over a billion dollars per year by getting that by getting that right. And and that's something that's 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 near term. People are making real inroads into these problems already. So um, that, that that some of the short term uses for that could be spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. So we got to partner with DHL a while back and we did a, a really neat case study with them where with DHL, you think of all these different package sizes that they're moving around. They're trying to get out to all of us as soon as possible. And with DHL, we used a quantum computer to help them decide really quickly, should this package go onto your truck? And while it seems like a small change, by loading those trucks more efficiently, you can think of how quickly that'll scale. So the DHL, it's a global company. So you start with one truck, but then you start to multiply that across your fleet. Then you multiply that across your countries, and then you do that globally. So that's the really neat thing about quantum computing is just the potential to scale and to take on these huge challenges that we have. So right now we're seeing people doing a proof of concept where they're starting small. So just figuring out, okay, so with the hardware that we have right now, what can we do? And these proofs of concept have so much promise to be scaled up down the line. So we're seeing some really neat things coming out of that. And uh, Brian, I'm seeing you nodding your head. So I know you've written a book on this space. You're another fantastic expert on quantum computing. If you have thoughts that you'd like to share, we're all yours. Well, so I guess I would just add, Danica, you know, love what you're, tell what you're telling this group, particularly about the liaison between quantum and business. I love that aspect. But what I love about CQC's solution is that it's across all of these different technology platforms. And there is no one technology platform for quantum that has sort of won out. I see John sort of nodding, you know, whether it's photonics or, um, you know, the quantum annealing solutions or whatever. But I love the fact is that CQC is, you know, leveling the playing field for business by overlaying that on any technology. Yeah, thank you. Oh, please go ahead, I interrupt someone. <laughs> And, and, and I think with, with that, so uh, obviously there, there's people better qualified than, than me to, to mention this, but it seems that with the hardware solutions, there may be, that in due course, it may be that one solution will be more focused for a particular task, another for a different task, and, um, and, and, and that they'll find their, their place within the ecosystem. Um, so having that, that um, tech agnostic platform to run upon it, um, and, and at the moment, we, I think th th there's so much attention needs to go into the state of the qubits, whereas on a classical computer, you don't necessarily look at, at what's happening under the hood. And a, a potentially a big step forward will come when actually you're not having to control that with your algorithm. Um, the software will, will automate that for you and, and you won't necessarily know if what parts are running on a photonic system and annealing system, an ion trap or, or indeed a classic transistor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right, John. And thank you, Brian, for that feedback. It's a, it's a really exciting space. All right, so I see a question about, can quantum computing help improve things like administration or governance of countries? That's a really interesting question. I don't think I've ever heard it framed quite like that. Um, so from a government perspective, quantum computing can be really valuable and appealing because it can take on such large, complex problems that have traditionally been out of reach. So if you just Google it. There's actually a lot of information out there about like how the U.S. government is approaching this. Just yesterday, I was looking at a report from the Canadian government. So if you type in, like try searching U.S. government quantum computing, you should find some really interesting uh, thought leadership about how people see us using this. And from my standpoint, one of the things that I really hope that we use this for is betterment of humanity. And I'm not saying that to be wishy-washy or to be um, grand in my thinking. I really do see a lot of potential for this being put to incredibly good use. And so a couple of thoughts on that. First, I remember this is all the way back in 2018 when we were just getting the quantum, the Minnesota quantum computing meetup off the ground. It was one of our very first meetings and we were talking about how do you see this being used. And within that same week that we had that meeting, there was this massive tsunami in India that displaced a ton of people, but there were very, not very many people got harmed because the government was so on it. What they did is they'd been tracking the weather. They saw that the tsunami was coming. So they started broadcasting on speakers every day. Hey, this is coming. If you're within this range of, if you're within this range of the coast, you need to be evacuating right now. 
So they evacuated people and I believe it was for a full week. So they, they started with telling people you need to go. Then they started sending in buses to help get people out. And then they did a final sweep with the military where it was saying, this is mandatory. Your life is at risk. And you're not only putting yourselves at danger, you're putting people around you at danger. So we really need to get you out of here. So the government evacuated all of these people from the coastal area. The tsunami hit. There was a lot of structural damage, but there wasn't the cost to human life wasn't near as high as it had been in the past because the government was so on top of getting people out. So as we look at applications for where we can apply quantum computing to better weather prediction, and especially as we think about climate change and how that's going to make things more complicated and harder, as we look at applying quantum computing to weather prediction and using that as like an early warning and early detection system, and then you can work with governments to do what the Indian government did, get people out of harm's way so that you can really lessen the damage there and the human cost that's going on. So from my personal point of view, I think that there's a lot of potential to help deal with climate change, help prevent people from becoming climate refugees because we can get them out of harm's way before it hits. So there's a lot of potential here to do great things with the predictive side. And then for CQC's part, there's a video out there that we did in partnership with the Quantum Daily. It's about 15 minutes long on YouTube and it's about a call to ethics because we know that in the past, a lot of incredibly powerful technology has been developed and it's moved so quickly that it's been a bit hard to get ahead of it and think about, well, what are all the ramifications of this going to be? So as we know that we're developing this incredibly powerful technology that's going to have really far reaching effects, we're trying to start that conversation now about how do we build this responsibly and how do we use it responsibly? So if that's, it sounds like that's something that might be of interest to you of how do we really use this for a beneficial way and to help the most people we can, I think that video out on YouTube of a call to action for quantum ethics would be something you might be interested in. And I think, yeah, that the, the whole, the, the ethics around technologies is a crucial, uh, of crucial importance. And I, I quite like that, that there's a lot of thought going into it before um, b before the impact. So there, there, there's a structure trying to be created, but the one the one thing that I think um, that, that I muse over quite a lot is, is if we get to a stage with quantum computing and machine learning, whereby um, it's, there's a pretty robust theory that if we continue doing this, it will lead to this. And, but the, the solution um, impacts on um, what people perceive as, the, as their right to do something. And um, obviously global warming is, is probably a good example of that. What the, what the pathway uh, for society would be? How, how much do we look at the, um, the results of the experiment or, or how much do we say, well, actually it's more important that we're allowed to do what we choose rather than take the, the, the choice of least damage? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so T, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but when John was talking about global warming, I immediately thought of the work you're doing with Bolt's AI and the fantastic work you're doing in the ag space. Would you like to talk about that at all? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to chime in. Um, so I think as Annika was very kindly shouting out to us before, so Bolt.ai is a, a startup that is looking to use quantum computing to help make agriculture more efficient and um, because by being doing by being able to do so, we are able to also make uh, agriculture more sustainable. Um, so Danica was talking about, about, for example, being able to make complex decisions using quantum computing. Um, agriculture is a field that has a lot of different data points on the farm at any moment. And being able to take advantage of all of that using quantum computing, we will be able to help make decisions on the farm more efficient and therefore saving resources and also um, preventing more pollution on the farm and therefore helping make agricultural production more sustainable as a whole. So yeah, that's the idea uh, that we were looking towards at Bulls.ai. And I think that's fantastic. So John, as you were mentioning climate change, just immediately thought of the work yeah. that the AI team we're doing is perfect fit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for shouting us to us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so Brian, I saw you just sent in a note about smart cities and traffic optimization. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. So some great work being done in Singapore and Lisbon and using, you know, traffic optimization is a perfect example of what um, T just talked about. It's very complex, lots of data points, 
and then able to, when we start thinking about autonomous cars and we start bringing that into the equation in the future, uh, just being able to um, more proactively route cars through a city and then hopefully the pollution uh, reduction that that will also enable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I wasn't aware of the work going on in Singapore and Lisbon. So you've given me something fun to research this afternoon. <laughs> that's excellent. Um, so, so then um, Mood Farhan Hassan, thank you so much for asking more questions. So I thought I, you asked about how can developing countries get into quantum computing hardware is it's quite expensive. Um, yeah, so, you know, India is, they're doing a lot of really good work with quantum computing. Um, so it's kind of a tricky one. I don't necessarily would call India a developing country or, or not, but to your point, it is expensive and there's ways that you can, you can try and work around that a little bit. So there's quantum simulators, that would be a good place to start, but then each business has their own model. So with Cambridge Quantum Computing, we have really close connections to IBM and Honeywell. So we're able to offer um, better rates to their computers than if you were to go work with IBM um, or Honeywell directly. So as you explore this space, you'll see that with the different business models, that can open up some possibilities. Um, I, I would imagine that what we'll probably see happening is maybe there will be groups that start to get together and that build that power in numbers. So just like we've seen um, businesses who will partner together where alone, it might be difficult for them to go far, but if they were to partner together, they can do quite a bit more. So this is speculation on my part, but it wouldn't surprise me if we start to see people forming coalitions and really uh, getting together to move this forward and to help them get the most out of their resources. But I'd love to hear from the audience if you have any additional thoughts on that. Yeah, one, one thing, um, if you look at, for example, One Quantum Africa, One Quantum India, some of the work that's um, that, that, that's being discussed on those platforms, there's, there's some really interesting developments there. Um, and, and, and the Quiskit program and, and things like that. Um, and I think as well, and this is, again, this is just my surmising, but I suspect as um, um, quantum volume increases, um, you'll find that the um, the, the the systems with um, perhaps less less power, but that can still create viable solutions, um, will become more accessible, and it, it'll be the you know the, the, the larger technology or the larger scale technologies that will come with a bigger price tag. But the the, the, the smaller scale technologies at a certain point will still be hugely um, valuable for solving real world problems. Um, and, and, and that kind of mix and match solution um, is something that can that can maybe help um, speed up the dissemination of, of the technology and, and you know working with systems in the cloud rather than having to create the the expensive hardware um, in, in a location um, directly. Yeah, absolutely. And John, you brought up a great point. I wish I thought of <laughs> as the industry matures, the costs are going to fall. So you see that time and time again with a lot of uh, bleeding edge technology and as new solutions are made, the better we get at it, the more we can start lowering the cost and opening up the accessibility. And so right now, the one of the barriers to entry is definitely the cost. But over time, my sense is that we'll see that start to fall and make it more open. Um, then to your question about naming a few institutes or companies that are using quantum to fight climate change, that's something that I would be happy to follow up with you on. And if you could either send me an email, I'll send my email into the chat real quick, or if you could send me a note on LinkedIn, I would be more than happy to follow up with that. I'm more than happy to follow up on that for you. So that's something I need to do a little bit more digging because while I know that it's happening, I don't have an immediate name that comes to mind and I want to be able to answer that for you. And both Danica and, and my details are on the um, LinkedIn page for the discussion as well. So feel free to reach out um, with with any questions or follow ups. Um, I'm you know I'm, I'm always happy to connect, and I'm pretty sure Danica is too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so speaking of climate change, I feel like I owe you an I owe you all an apology because my air conditioner is broken, <laughs> <laughs> and I can feel the temperature going up in my house. So I'm sorry <laughs> if um, <laughs> I'm starting to look a little bit messy compared to the beginning of the call. It's just, it's slowly getting warmer in here. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, not, it's not the questions, is it? <laughs> no, it's not the questions. It's just, it's getting really hot. So. 
<laughs> the good news is my AC is getting replaced tomorrow. So for the call at the end of the month, I can stay composed the whole time. But it's not <laughs> it's <laughs> if, if, if I may just raise the, the temperature of discussion a, a touch as well. So um, coinciding with today's talk is, is the breaking news that Cambridge Quantum Computing and Honeywell Quantum uh, Solutions uh, planned merger has broke today. So uh, first of all, may I say that entangled discussions is the perfect medium for these sorts of announcements. Um, but, but more pertinently, um, you know, what, what, what was your initial reaction to such an exciting development um, that, that has the potential to really change the landscape? I'm so sorry, could you repeat that? I have a cat that just walked in. So she, oh, that is fine. He's so, been meowing, so he and the cat, it'll be better next time. <laughs> so obviously we, um, the, the, the news broke today of um, Cambridge Quantum Computing and Honeywell Quantum Solutions planned merger. Um, and obviously, you know, whilst I welcome um, the announcement being being broadcast on on entangled discussions, um, I think more pertinently, I, it'd be, I'd really like to, to to know what your initial reaction is to such exciting developments that can that, that have the potential to to change the whole landscape um, unrecognizably. Yeah, absolutely. So, on a personal note, I am just beyond thrilled. I have so much respect for the Honeywell team, and as I mentioned. We have a very close relationship with them, so it's it's really been a privilege to get to know them and work with them over the past few months, and they're doing incredible work. And what's so neat about this partnership is that, well, we're going to become even closer with Honeywell, and this is really going to strengthen the offerings that we have, but we'll still get to be hardware agnostic, so we can continue running our clients' algorithms on the quantum computers that are the best fit for them. So it's it's a nice best of both worlds situation where we get to bring together the hardware and the software providers in a way that we haven't seen before, while also still keeping those close relationships where we have with the other hardware providers. Um, so it's really a fantastic thing that I'm very excited about. Um, Anand, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know that you're really thrilled about this too. So if you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you're more than welcome. Yeah, I think uh, one of the uh, really cool things that may come out of this relationship is uh, developing a first kind of quantum OS. And that's just going to be huge for the industry and being able to have our scientists with their software expertise uh, get to be really close with the hardware experts and learn the nuances of the device and how the device is going to improve. I think that's going to be a game changer. So from my perspective, really excited uh, about this announcement as well. Yeah, I, I, I think the, 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 the potential there is, is, is phenomenal. Um, really, really nice to be sort of an interested onlooker as, um, as, as these things come into play. Um, and particularly with, with two such um, respected entities that are, that are really um, creating unique solutions. Um, and, and it's nice, actually, Danica, what, what you mentioned that, um, you know, you're still able to interact with others in the landscape um, to provide that uh, best of breed solution, because I, I think that one of the one of the, the, the um, nice factors of where the industry is at the moment is that it, to a large degree, it's kind of at a pre-competitive stage. Obviously, businesses need to compete to survive, but there's there's interaction um, across the landscape, which I think is powering the the development. So um, it'll be fascinating, um, Anand, to see how that 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 the um, operating system pans out and 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 and, and what um, what that propels forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that we're really excited about with the existing frameworks that we have. Uh, we anticipate getting a boost from being able to work more closely with Honeywell and. To Anand's point, getting a good understanding of the machines is crucial to helping continue to drive this technology forward. And I did see a question in the chat. Um, it was about where is the bottleneck for quantum computing and what needs to help drive this forward? I believe that was from Fenton. A technical and scientific achievements that quantum computing will need to meet the demands. My sense is that the hardware is where we're seeing the biggest bottleneck right now. So we know that as we continue to add uh, qubits, that we'll be able to run algorithms that are more demanding, uh, we'll be able to look at more data. But right now, the hardware is where it's, it's difficult to make this stuff work. And we are cheering on all the hardware providers, all of the researchers. What they're doing is remarkably hard. 
and any step forward is great progress. So we, we really look at all the small changes will add up to eventually very big ones that help unlock just fantastic potential. And there's been some really nice roadmaps that have gotten put out by like IBM and Honeywell in particular that show where they project their qubits and their computers capacity going. And it's it's really exciting to see what they're thinking they can get done and we'll keep watching that very closely. And I think the, the roadmaps that are, that are published are fascinating because it seems that that, that often there, there's an overachievement, that the, that the planned growth is actually um, not, not as great as what actually occurs. So it, it's really it's really fascinating to see to see that develop. Um, it, it's also nice that um, pe other people seem to be having cat issues. Uh, hopefully, 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 no one heard the cat fight that was going on at the start of the call. So <laughs> Sch Schrodinger would be pleased. Yes, exactly. You know, what is a quantum computing call without at least one cat? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Fenton, to your point about energy efficiency, so there are different types of quantum computers, and we have ion trap, or that my sense is ion trap can run at room temperature. Uh, but then with superconducting, it takes incredibly uh, cold temperatures to be able to run. And I need to dig into more of the requirements of exactly how this hardware works. Um, but with superconducting, it can be, uh, I think it can be another barrier to entry of when you, when a provider looks at what type of quantum computer they want to try and build, but taking into consideration all the freezers that incredibly a taxing infrastructure that they need is going to be something they'll have to think about. And again, we've seen different types of algorithms will run better on one type of computer than another. So I'm certainly not advocating for one type of hardware over another. They all have their place, but at the same time, each one has unique considerations. And, and there are there are solutions um, envisaged that, that run at room temperature. Um, that I, th I think there's there's obviously a, a way to go with these technologies, but um, there, there, there's certainly some some robust um, ideas around this, and, and, and people actually um, putting these putting these um, techniques into play. So um, watch this space. Yes, absolutely. Watch this space. And uh, Peter, if you're, it sounds like you may not be as familiar with Schrodinger's cat, and it's a almost a running joke in the quantum computing community. Of jokes about Schrodinger's cat pop up all the time. So if you ever want. It's a fun afternoon of reading, or if you like YouTube, there's a ton of really good material out there about Schrodinger's cat and the importance to quantum computing and the importance to how it has helped this community grow and helped kick off research. Yeah, and it was um, essentially it was a way of saying that that quantum's ridiculous; it won't work because um, I, I, it, it's, uh, I won't go into the the details. We're doing interaction, and actually, it's kind of turned out that it. it actually validates the, um, the quantum, quantum theories. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, so I, I thought, I oh, go ahead, Peter, please. Uh, hello, everyone. No, I thought, uh, just joking, I thought oh. that Annika <laughs> and, and Fenton uh, got Schrodinger's cat uh, <laughs> at the desk, okay? Yeah, I know the story. <laughs> No, 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 Peter, don't apologize. You know, I am actually really bad at getting jokes uh, to the point yeah, where yeah. people make fun of me all the time because I miss so many of his jokes. They land flat and he's great around other people. But I think I'm the issue here. <laughs> <It wasn't. laughs> okay. yeah. Same for my partner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I think, okay. I think, I think the question from Amrita is, um, is is certainly one I think you can have value with Danica. Yeah, absolutely. So, for case studies, um, Amrita, I you know I've already committed to following up with you some papers. So I'll send you some business case studies for this too. IBM has a, a really nice graphic that they've put together, where it's asking a few key questions about how do you qualify whether or not this is going to be a good fit for uh, quantum computing. And I believe one of the first questions is like, is this an NP hard problem? So is this a really large problem? Um, is it something where classical computers have been a bottleneck? And it asks these, you go through a series of four or five questions to try and figure out, will this be a good fit or not? I'll try and pull up a link to it on the side because it's a very nice resource. Um, but there's 
there's a few key qualifying questions that you can ask. And then once you've asked those questions and sort of validated, like, you know what, I think that this would be a good fit. It's a nice near-term use case. Then you start to go into more of the business complexities of, do we have the budget for this? Do we have the resources for this? So there's the set of immediate questions that you can ask up front. And then once you get through those gates, there's more questions that you can take to start getting that deeper. Um, Brian, because you have written a book about this, I'd love to hear your thoughts if you're open to that. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. The, the challenges are many, but what's interesting about quantum computing, and yes, it's not that mature uh, relative to other technologies, is sort of what John talked about. You know, these are these are large hardware capabilities, but they're built into the cloud. So, you know, companies who are going to be users of quantum computing should be less interested in the hardware premise uh, as to more standard business technology issues and their key performance indicators and goals. So if they're actually thinking, you know, we have a goal to achieve, you know, it was the same sort of situation with artificial intelligence where people saw a shiny object. So the question really, I guess for them really was, you know, is this technology going to suit our needs? And the same has to be true of quantum computing where uh, a hybrid capability between using classical and quantum will continue to be the solution for quite some time. Uh, yeah, so Brian, I actually have a copy of your book. <laughs> so plug it now. <laughs> so, and Rita, Brian has written this book called Quantum Boost, and I'll send a link to you. You can buy a copy on Amazon. It's a, a really good book. I would definitely recommend taking a look at that. In addition to the IBM uh, graphic, it, it goes in depth. I think it'd be a fantastic resource for you. Thank you. And, and, and plugs more than welcome. <laughs> I didn't know that was I didn't know that was part of the entangled group solution. So I'm very happy. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, and I think so. We've got um, also a question from Farhan as well. Um, a few estimates say to become economically viable, we need a quantum computer with above 100,000 qubits. Let the current yet the current quantum computers with less than 500 qubits. Um, also made a significant contribution. Uh, which estimate is true, um, and what does it mean to um, to hit those marks? I'm. My sense is that we don't need to hit that high of a qubit count to really be effective. We're already starting to make good progress in like quantum cybersecurity. As I mentioned before, we only need to legitimately four qubits um, to make that work. With drug discovery, we're already seeing a lot of uh, really good work being done. We got to partner with uh, Roche on uh, speeding up their drug development. We've also partnered with Crown Bio and JSI Life Sciences for speeding up their uh, work around cancer, marker, cancer markers and helping them get drugs to market faster. So uh, there will probably be a tipping point where when we hit a certain number of qubits, that's when we're really going to see things open up in a big way. So I don't think that we need to hit that high of a number that John shared. I think you're right. Um, we will see a tipping point and that once that opens up, that's going to be a really great watershed moment for the community. But I think that even with the more limited hardware that we have right now, we can still do some very meaningful things, which is part of why this there's a lot of excitement, a lot of people really pushing for this to help or pushing for this to get done. But does that help at all? And I, I think as well, um, Rupesh Shravastava um, of Oxford University's Quantum Computing User Engagement Group was on a previous talk. Um, and he used the analogy of um, when, uh, 100 or so years ago, when people first started using motor cars instead of the horse and whilst there was there was some early benefits no one quite envisaged um aston martin db9s or, or the, the sorts of cars we've got now so there's there's probably a scale of benefits um within that and actually probably some of the output from quantum computing can help charge the development of future quantum computing as well so um it's that it, 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 i think the the the, the notion of, of of what value is is certainly going to to play into that um and, and, and as danica said I, th th there'll probably be a tipping point where things um really grow exponentially yeah absolutely 
So. Manindir is saying, oh, uh, go ahead, John. Uh, no, no, sorry, please, please. Anand, I saw you raised a point in the chat about applications in chemistry, and I know this is an area, an area where you have deep expertise, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Yeah, uh, so with chemistry and material science, what we're seeing is that while quantum computers can kind of natively treat quantum systems and quantum uh, materials, uh, we're limited to the system sizes that we can tackle, and that is directly based on the number of qubits we have on today's computers. So the increase in the number of qubits and really hitting those milestones that IBM and Google and Honeywell have put out uh, just means that we can simulate larger system sizes and more kind of real world materials, uh, both kind of in the pharmaceutical industry as well as uh, material science applications. So that's where we'll see a lot, a lot of growth come in. And I think there's going to be this cyclic, uh, cyclical growth um, or compounding effect where once we start to simulate uh, better materials that exhibit quantum properties. We can create better quantum computers, simulate better materials and create them, creating better quantum computers. So uh, yeah, it's just a fascinating prospect. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you, Anand. All right, so it looks like some people have to drop. Thank you so much again, to everyone for joining. It's really a privilege to be able to talk with you. Yeah, and, and, and likewise, thank, thanks everyone for joining in. And obviously, thank you, Danica. Um, it's been a been a fascinating talk where we, we've covered so much ground. And it, it's nice because we often have these sorts of conversations. So it's nice to open it up to, um, to a wider audience. Um, and for those who, who maybe weren't available for the whole talk, um, we have got um, an Entangled Discussions page on YouTube, which you can subscribe to see the previous talks. This talk will go on there and future talks. Um, we're back next week um, where we'll be joined by the team at Quantum London. Um, so it'll be at the same time, 4.30 BST, um, where we'll be speaking about um, applications for um, real world business uses again um, and how, how um, technology can be integrated um, into existing, um, existing industries. Um, and also, um, we we are every, we are on every week with the final week of the month, so the 29th of June. Um, Danica and all the monthly guests will be back, where we have um, a true entangled discussion, and everyone will sit together and hopefully take these ideas further. So, thanks everyone for joining, and thank you, Danica. Thank you very much.